is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering One Piece, episodes 414 and 415, All Out Special Power Battle, Gum Gum versus Snake Snake, aka Gomu Gomu versus Hebi Hebi, and 415, give me a second, Hancock's Confession, The Sisters' Disgusting Past, or abhorrent past, depending on whose translation you're getting. In this episode, I'm so sorry that I overwatched last week, so I've talked about some of this already, but thankfully, the one I watched already was mostly fighting, and I still feel I've got plenty to talk about. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you so much to Florian for commissioning this episode. What's up, Florian? Florian is here in the chat. Appreciate you very much. And apologies to anybody who wanted to come to this live but didn't make it because of the confusion with the changing of event rooms for Crowdcast. But hopefully, by the next event, we will be all set and it will be a little bit simpler for everybody to figure out. Um, I also had some trouble, so don't feel bad. So, like I said in the last episode, I already had watched the All Out Special Power Battle, but I only talked about it in a broad stroke sort of way because I was trying to figure out what the deal was with what's on the girls' backs. Um, And it turns out that what's going on is not something that we were supposed to really know about. And I think that I said something about the fact that Hachi had been covering up a mark on his forehead and the fact that he didn't want people to see it. And the way that Luffy said, like, that looks familiar I don't remember if I actually like drew that connection, but I know that I had been thinking about it. And then I sort of put it away because of the explanation that we were given that the sisters were just, they had some ability to turn people to stone on their backs. So I was like accepting that explanation and I pretty much set aside entirely the possibility of what, of there being any connection between Hachi and the sisters. But it turns out that there is potentially a connection. It's a little bit tenuous, but we will get there. So first, let's actually talk about the battle here. Um, Reminder, 313 ended with Luffy tapping into hockey and not realizing that's what he had done. So he has like a moment of victory over them, but everybody seems to accept that since he doesn't know what he did, that his fight is not going to improve, that that was a one-time thing. He screamed for everybody to stop when they were about to smash the friend that helped him. And that caused them to halt, but it was a momentary, like, emotional outburst, and that likely he won't be able to replicate that and you know, catch up to them in the battle. It turns out though, that as much as he's like the, the hockey thing, it sort of does not seem to come up again, this fight, but he does go into, I think second gear. I don't think he does third gear because second gear, remind me guys, second gear is the one where he like looks like a hot water bottle. Right. And third gear Is that the one where he turns real small after and he can punch like incredibly hard? What is third gear? I have trouble remembering. Um, But I don't think he does third. I think he only does second. But one of the sisters spits something at him here. And it's this like a venom, I think. And... It, there's a sort of hissing when it lands on one of the uh, fences so that it seems 
it's eating through it. Like it's the acid that spills out of the mouth of the, uh, the alien in alien. So as much as he has been kind of getting his ass handed to him, this is the, the, he is still like attempting to make the same hits and he doesn't seem to understand like how best to deal with them initially. And when he says, stop, that's enough. All of the, like, there's a bunch of women in the audience who pass out as well. So we're seeing that like all over again. And honestly, as much as I'm not a fan of like backing up to show us what just happened, I kind of appreciated it because I keep forgetting the way that hockey can affect certain people. And I'm really wondering, and, and there may be an explanation to this that I don't get to know about yet. So if that's the case, then obviously don't tell me. But um, <laughs> sorry, Florian's in the chat. He says, yeah, second is fast and third is strength with drawbacks. And then in parentheses, he wrote small, S-M-O-L. Very nice. Thank you, Florian. Florian, I just want to say how, like, saying that I am impressed is so inadequate. The fact that you can speak another language and you also do like slang and meme speak in that language, I just can't wrap my head around it. Like I'm I'm sure that to a to a degree it, you just absorb it because of being in the groups that you're in and stuff. I, I you know, but I just can't imagine and every time that you bust out some shit like this, I'm just like, oh, my God, how is he like, you're as good at my language as I am. And it's not your native language. And it makes me feel like I really should try harder at life. <laughs> I should really just make more of an effort. You know what I'm saying? Um, but anyway, so what I wanted to ask was, why is the hockey when the when the sisters use it not making the women pass out is it because they know how to direct it better because luffy just basically yells that's enough and he just it's just an outburst it's not like focused on anybody so i'm assuming that's why it's like he doesn't really know exactly how to wield it yet so it's just kind of splashing outward on everybody um, the, the thought that I have about this is, uh, in the Dresden files, for those of you who have not read the Dresden files, the main character is a wizard and he has a lot of like strength to his magic, but he talks frequently about how, despite having like a lot of raw power, there is, a, a, a an inefficiency to the way he uses magic and that growing older and more experienced makes it so that you aren't expending a ton of extra energy to do a small thing. And there is a witch that he meets that is able to, the force that he uses in a spell of his, it's called Fuego. And it's just this like basically flamethrower kind of spell. And she can focus that same amount of power into like a laser pointer thin type you know what i'm saying so it's so much more clean and efficient and i really like the idea that that is what's going on here is that the sisters are more experienced with using hockey and so it doesn't have this like <laughs> it doesn't cause collateral damage because they know where to direct it. But that's just a total theory, you know? Um, David says on a scale of one to 10, how good is the Island and how fitting is it to Luffy? It's so funny because the Island is like, it works. F it works for Luffy as a man because he is so not horny. Any other dude I feel like on this Island would have a bad time, but Luffy is so bizarrely sexless that it's just like of no interest to him. And I feel like if he showed any more leering, they would have no tolerance for it. 
But because he's just kind of like, I don't know, I mean, walk around in a bikini, I guess. Who cares? I'm naked. It's fine. I, it's They seem much more accepting. Um, I want Luffy to play hockey and be confused because hockey isn't involved. It's a terrible joke, David. Negative 10 points. Leave immediately. Um, so anyway, this... Uh, we when we come back to them after like you know they've begun to realize oh he can use hockey but he's not great at it uh they pick the fight back up but he has sort of after being able to stop them from breaking his friend it seems like he turned a corner and really understood for the first time what the stakes really are here. I'm not saying that he wasn't taking them seriously before, but he was treating them like they could be reasoned with, I guess. And he's just starting to understand now that's not the the vibe. This is they don't want to talk and I've got to approach this like it's me or them. So yeah, he says, I'm going to go beat up these big snake ladies. He's talking to the girl who got turned to stone. And he goes, okay, now let's do this. And he has a lot more confidence all of a sudden, which makes sense. He was just able to stop them from doing something. And he doesn't really know why. He seems to think it was just like he was forceful enough, you know? Um, but yeah, so... Again, with the Venom, this stuff is so, like, I really, I don't want them to land Venom on him, but I do kind of want to see what would happen. I have to assume he would just begin to melt. It would probably be pretty bad. But, yeah, he is dodging like crazy, and they're starting to be like, how is he managing to get away from us for the first time? He's actually being faster than we are, which they are not used to. And that's the first sign that shit is beginning to go a different direction. Then we have all of this like purple smoke that begins to formulate around him. At some point, somebody calls it a poison gas attack. I couldn't tell if the gas was like coming from the venom that got spit out or if it's like, I was about to say if it's coming from somewhere else and then I realize that it makes it look like, makes it sound like she's farting out this gas. But honestly, why not? Sure. That's probably what she's doing. Um, and she tells him, I think it's Marigold who's talking to him, uh, that she's weakening him so that she can take care of him easily. And he really starts to get a bit faint here. Like there's a moment of, oh no. Like once you start introducing these sorts of substances, it doesn't feel like a fair fight anymore. And I recognize that that's not really reasonable because people have got these devil fruit powers. So they can take all kinds of forms. And if you're going to allow one person's devil fruit power, you got to just allow all of them because otherwise it's not fair. But it does seem to me that if one person's devil fruit power is they turn into a giraffe and another person's devil fruit power is that they emit poison gas, they do not feel like they are on par with one another. That's all I'm saying. It's just inherently unfair. So at this point, he is really taking a beating again. Like it looked like he was managing and he starts to get beaten in it's the sort of thing where he gets punched in one direction with her tail and before he can fully fall, she catches him in the other direction by punching him. You know what I mean? Like it's just a lot of uh, him getting slapped around and it feels really undignified. Like there was something about this. I, I was just sort of going, Oh, sweetie, as I was watching it. So he's like attempting to, get his legs back under him and he pauses and they think they've got him. So one of them has this like, I guess it's a hatchet, an ax. And she goes for him. He does manage to dodge it. And this is when he goes flying toward that pit that's full of spikes. 
And as he is like falling, he realizes that he's not fuzzy anymore because he is out of the range of the gas. So he reaches up and grabs the edge and manages to save himself from falling onto the spikes. And he's just swinging through here. It's great. He's doing a sort of, uh, it's, what's the word I want? Who's, who's, who's the guy? Not George of the Jungle. You guys know what I'm talking about. The dude who swung on vines, who was the uh, Tarzan. Tarzan, that's the guy. It's a sort of Tarzan vibe because it's, it's very consistent the way he's swinging through here. And he is like attacking them from up in the air. So he's got a little bit more protection from this gas. And while he's up there, he inflates himself into a giant balloon and then expends all of the air so that he blows away the gas and the venom. I really didn't think he was going to manage the venom because it's like, you know, we have the animation of the wind hitting the venom and it sits there unchanged for a minute before it finally dissipates. I love it, though, when he lands, he's like, all of that was really getting on my nerves. Now I can beat you guys up like I was supposed to. I just love Luffy so much sometimes, you guys. Like, there's, there are, are, are times where I want to kill him. Don't get me wrong. You know, he is just infuriating at times. And I'm just like, why are you in charge? And then there are times like this where he is so innocently, all right, well, now it's time to whip your asses. I was meant to do that like five minutes ago. Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> so both of the uh, snake women are like, dude, I don't know why you suddenly think you can beat the hell out of us. You had a chance and you weren't taking it. It wasn't happening. I don't really buy it. And this is when he goes into second gear and steam begins to come off him and he starts to do that weird glowy thing. And everybody is like, what is happening over there? And the it's sort of weird. The women who are fighting him seem to think that it is just the way that men are. They're like just going men are way different from us, aren't they? And really like, so I, I, I look, I'm going to do one of those things yet again, where I admit there's a reason why we're pretending this isn't the case. It's for the joke, right? It's for the joke of that. None of them know what a man is and whatever, but it's been, told to us that women will leave the island and come home with child. So we've definitely got women out here fucking and knowing what a man is. And yet none of the women on the island have ever seen a dude before. Methinks that is not correct. That doesn't seem like it's probable. But anyway, um, so yeah, he he gets himself ready and he begins to go at them in gear two and his hits are beginning to land. And that's really all it is at first. It's not even that he's beating them. It's simply that he lands a hit, which he had been unable to do a minute ago. And uh, both of the sisters are like, all right, well, if you want to play like this, I guess we're really going to go for it. And the one says Medusa hair, eight headed serpent. And I've got to be honest, I was really happy to see because, you know, we've had the mention of the fact that they can turn them into stone and the fact that they're snakes. And there's been a lot of like Medusa ish imagery here, but nothing outright. And I was just like, OK, here, finally, here we go. Um, So, yeah, her hair turns into snakes. And I don't mean like her hair be suddenly transforms into snake bodies. I mean that her hair is forming itself into the shape of snakes. And those snakes jaws are like strong enough that they're biting through the, the edges of like the fencing that 
section off the fighting area from the audience which honestly, all I kept thinking was just like, you guys are doing so much damage. You really are going to have to pay a lot to repair this little arena. Like, it just seems thoughtless. Be a little bit more considerate. So Sandersonia is going after him hard with her hair. But he just manages to knock her the fuck out. And it's definitely an upset. The fact that she goes down, nobody was expecting that. And Marigold bashes at him and is like worried for her sister she's so upset and didn't expect that she was gonna have to like go, first of all go up against him alone that he would be able to take her sister down i don't think she's ever had to worry about her before um so she's telling him your attacks just bounce off me dude so come at me if you want it's not gonna happen i can match your speed so go ahead and try as much as you want but it's not gonna happen and this is what I had described earlier, where she's just like, how is he so fast? Because he uses Jet Bazooka. And so his speed is just an entirely different echelon than it was before. She was dealing with Luffy in his first gear. And this time, when he does the bazooka, he hits her so hard that she falls onto like the staircase outside of the arena. And... She doesn't like fall into the uh, the pit here, but it's pretty close. It's a moment of just like, uh oh, at this point, Hancock is just like, what the fuck are you guys doing? Y'all were supposed to take care of this guy and you're out here playing these games and letting him get, you know, get the drop on you. Finish this shit so we can move on with our goddamn day. I'm sick of it. You all know what he did. It's unforgivable. Take care of it. So here comes Sandersonia again with the eight-headed serpent. And I'm just like, girl, we've been through this, though. You know this doesn't work. Marigold, though, lights her ass up. And when I say that she lights her ass up, I mean herself. She is on fire. And... It's pretty cool looking. I've got to say when she is like completely covered in fire, her hair also turns into snakes, but they are fiery snakes, which seems like she's got a real advantage over her sister's version. I must say Luffy launches himself backward. He does Gatling and he essentially punches their hair out of shape. So they're no longer snakes, which uh, I don't know. There's something about that that's really funny to me. Like they just had really, really good definition in their curls. And then he just like ran his hands through it and fucked it up <laughs> as somebody with curly hair. Um, and then as he's like falling to the ground, he does a split and kicks them in the chest. And they like try it's like they're avoiding falling into the pit. So they fall toward each other in such a way that poor Sandersonia is engulfed in her sister's flames and is burning up. I honestly did feel for her because Marigold is so, she says something like, Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. And there's something about her just like having hurt her sister and in a, such a terrible way, fire is just the worst that I really felt, for her for a second so they're trying to like get away from each other and they realize that he has tied their tails together which is genuinely so disrespectful and this is when sandersonia begins to fall towards the pit and because she was on fire her whole back is exposed and that all of the women are like peering down at her and uh, at first, it seems like Hancock doesn't understand the danger. She, at first, she's just like, this is fucking pathetic. And then she's like, oh, my God, her back is exposed. Somebody. And we have a little flashback. And then Luffy jumps out onto her back and covers it up. And when he does this, Andersonia doesn't get why. 
And she thinks he's like going to attack her and is like, he's totally exposed. Sister, why are you just standing there? Do something. And Marigold is like, you don't get it. He's protecting you. He's covering up your back. All of the women in the audience, though, are talking about how he's protecting us. Otherwise, we would be turned to stone. So because they have this other story, it's interesting to me, like, if they had only kept their backs secret in a general sense, sorry, I hit my mic, him jumping on her back would not seem significant to the audience. But because they have circulated this alternate story of the, you know, the eye on their back that would turn them to stone, despite the audience misunderstanding, they still see significance in what he's doing here. So they're still giving him credit. It's just like for the wrong thing, which I sort of like, because this means that they all in this moment also understand Luffy's generosity of spirit where he's not attempting to just get the drop on her while he has the chance and win the battle because she's vulnerable. He is doing something for the sake of them all. So they think, and, uh, at this point, Hancock, who really thought she understood the kind of dude Luffy is, she stands up and yells for all of the women to get out of the arena. So it's just her and her sisters. And she's like really moved by the fact that he wasn't going to take advantage of this moment to win the fight. Meanwhile, the old lady whose name I can't remember is off to the side and she's uh, talking to herself about how the princess like has everybody fooled despite being a terrible person and, you know, hiding this huge secret. And it's time now that she basically come to grips with what kind of ruler she wants to be. And Hancock off to the side has started crying. And I thought, she was crying because she was like so moved by what Luffy has done. But honestly, once you hear her story later, I think it's more, she is reacting to the memories of what happened to her, you know, like she went through a trauma and she has been sort of trying to run away from that. And it's not working. She is still faced with it here. So going, we, we jump to the next episode at this point and, um, Luffy is trying to make a deal with her here. At first he's like checking on the statue of the woman and making sure that she's okay. And he's like, all right, so you can fix all of them, right? You can just turn them human again. And Hancock is like, yeah, I can do that. But you have somewhere that you want to be. So I'm going to give you a choice. You can either get a ship to bring you where you want to go. Or I change them back. That's it. You get one or the other. And she really thinks she has set up a flawless trap here. She's like, ha ha. Now everybody's going to get to see. Which like... You know, because we know Luffy, we know 100% what he would, what he's going to pick here. But she just wants to prove mostly to herself at this point, because there's no other women in the arena anymore. They've all left. So it's not even about her proving to everybody else what he's like. She wants to believe it herself that he's like worthy of what she was trying to do to him. And instead, and, and you guys, like, I know that Luffy is going to pick turning them back to humans, right? That he's going to bring them back to life, basically. But the thing that takes it over the top for me here is not simply that. It's that he 
doesn't complain about her making the deal one or the other. It's one thing to make the choice that's the like kind and generous choice. It's another thing to make the kind and generous choice without any feelings of bitterness or resentment. And I'll tell you what, kiddos, I could never like, excuse me, I'm just burped into my mic. Oh my God. I'm so sorry. I don't even know where that came from. Um, but I just personally have like done the right thing. And I will freely say out loud, but this sucks though. I just want everybody aware this fucking sucks and I don't like it. The idea of doing it while thanking her because he says, that's great. Well, okay, go ahead and turn him back. And then he like presses his head to the ground and says, seriously, thank you. And he's grinning from ear to ear. And as she comes down to turn them back, he is smiling so bright and is so happy. Meanwhile, like yours truly would be like, well, then turn them back. I don't get why you have to make it into a one or the other thing. It doesn't have to be like that. But yeah, turn them back if you're going to be a dick about it. Go ahead. I would just be very snotty. I couldn't help it because she's being a bitch for no reason. She just wants to dislike him. And so it would be very valid if he was just like, well, fuck you then. And he's not. He's grateful, which truly is a totally different beast, you know. Um, And the old lady says he has such an immensely powerful hockey, but didn't hesitate to save those he owes. Which I think what she means is basically like he is so powerful that he could just take what he wants and, you know, and be out of here. I don't know if she really gets the way that the sisters did that he can't control his hockey or what. But anyway, so outside of the gate to this arena, all of the audience is like standing there waiting and they're wondering what the snake princess has done. And unexpectedly, the women who got turned to stone step out and all of these ladies are like, what happened? Oh my God, she turned you back. And it turns out they have no memory of what she did to them, which um, it was a really surprising thing to me that they don't recall what happened. I think it's for the best probably, but I didn't expect amnesia to be like a side effect of it, you know? Um, so, they're all like, you know, thanking the snake princess and apologizing because we have a little bit of a flashback. And she says, continue to dedicate yourselves to the protection of our nation. And she just walks away from them and leaves them to their devices. And they're, the audience is asking these women, well, so what did she do with the man? And one of them says, isn't it obvious she turned him to stone and just got on with her day, which I really enjoyed that, like, phrasing. And just got on with her day. But then they find out he is not stone. He has been brought to the castle. So at this point, we go to Luffy. I'm saying castle. It's like palace. I don't know. But he wants to get fed and keeps being like, dude, you feed me and we're even no hard feelings at all. I just want some meat. We'll be good. They're not giving him any food, though. He's getting really frustrated. And when he goes into the next room, she's standing there with no top on. And he is so uninterested. And it's just like, I really hoped I was going to get roast beef or something. Like, what is this? And... She says, I want you to look at this and tell me if you've seen it before, like where you've seen it. And she pulls her hair aside and we see this mark and it's a brand clearly because as she's pulling her hair to the side, 
all of these memories are flashing through her mind of like a brazier of coals. And it's obviously that this was done with heat and it's a circle with three triangles, like little claws pointing upward and one pointing downward, which I think is supposed to be kind of a, an oversimplified dragon claw sort of symbol. Um, so then Luffy says, there's a friend of mine who's a fish man named Hachi and he's got a mark kind of like that on his forehead, but it's not exactly the same. I've not seen one like yours before. And this is when, oh, Granny Nyon, that's her name. She comes in and she's like, you can trust him. You have to see that. If he doesn't know what it is, just go ahead and tell him. Your secret is clearly safe with this guy. And Hancock does not want to say. But she's like, all right, fine. Here it goes. And I have to really, I want to point out something that I loved about this. That she is telling him this story and is getting genuinely like really upset recounting all of this. And he tries to tell her that he doesn't need to hear anymore. He's basically like, this is obviously causing you trauma to go into again. So just, I know enough. You don't have to do this to yourself. And I really liked that aspect of it, that he had so much compassion for them, even after the fact with just telling him their story, you know, but that's a little bit later at this point, the granny is like, wait a minute. I think I recognize you. You're in the newspaper. And she says, you're the one who punched a celestial dragon. And all of them are fucking floored. Like genuinely, are you, are you kidding? How are you here then? Like what, how could you have gotten away with doing that? And he's like, I told you already that I got flung here. I don't know how I'm here. I just got thrown and I wound up here and we get this moment where Hancock is saying, you're just like him. And we find out about this dude who is apparently dead now. Um, but he was somebody who went up against the celestial dragons himself and he came in and like freed everybody. And it was a big, it was just a big deal, but we'll get there in a second. So she explains to Luffy, my sisters and I were on one of our ships and we got abducted and it was like broad daylight and we got taken and we were auctioned off and we get to see like in a sort of dramatic silhouette, the, the celestial dragons, how they have those weird bowls on their heads. They, there's no specifics about who each one of them is, but you know that they're part of the crew because of how they're dressed and their faces are just really indistinct. And, this mark on their backs was a brand from being made into slaves and all of the faces around them. It really seems like they're all men. And she says to Luffy, um, all the first men we ever encountered were nothing but figures of cruelty and horror, which, um, there's no, detail but i am just going to assume sexual assault like just there's you don't abduct girls of this age and put them into slavery and that's not part of the deal like probably it would be a factor for young boys too but it's it's more possible it's not than it is for girls i just have to assume um so as she's telling the story, she's like, her sisters are really starting to freak out. And she says, it was so awful. 
like we just prayed for death. It was four years of this. And eventually one night this guy shows up and it's, she says it was accepted as a rule of the world that no one would dare challenge the celestial dragons. But on that fateful night, there was a man who scaled the red line with his bare hands and slipped into Marie Joie, the Holy land of the celestial dragons. And like, I was sort of expecting, honestly, you guys, that this might have been like Ace or somebody, but she says that his name was Fisher Tiger. He wanted to release one of his fellow fishmen. And even though he hated humans, he still let all of the humans out of slavery as well. So I really appreciated that because, you know, you, you hate humans and like humans are the ones that have put you in here. I wouldn't have been too angry if he were just like, nah, fuck all y'all. But he doesn't. He lets all of these slaves out and we get to see this escape. There's definitely like a giant in amongst them and everything. Um, And she says, we all fled totally willing to risk death. It was no problem. Um, And there's this, like, I, I want to mention as they're leaving, her and her sisters still look like Marigold looks normal. She looks like the, the only one that doesn't is uh, Sandra Sonia. She's got a really, really big head, but Marigold is just kind of taller than her sister. It's not really like her body looks almost disfigured the way that Sandersonia's does. Um, but anyway, she says we, we owed a debt to him in the end. Tiger unleashed an army. Fishmen swarmed the oceans, but they were cursed to wear the mark of slavery. So Tiger, because he was being hunted by the world government, brought the fugitives together to form the pirates of the sun. And, she says that they erased their bondage by making a new brand that went over the celestial dragon brand and changed them to symbols of the sun. And today those pirates all still wear that brand. And because they all wear it, it does not necessarily signify that they were ever a slave. Some of them might have been. But they also may have just been branded because they're part of that crew. Um, and she's like, so that's why you saw Hachis and you thought it looked familiar because it's, it looks familiar because it's so similar. Um, and she says that the, the pirates disbanded after this guy died. He's been dead for some time. Um, and they split into several factions and we see Arlong when she says that it's like transposed over the screen. And, uh, I was really like disappointed at the idea that Arlong had been one of his pirates because like he was just such a bastard and having come from a crew that, was explicitly formed to fight back against slavery. Arlong basically was trying to have slaves himself, you know, like that's what he was attempting to do. So I just was a little bit like, man, you really just betrayed the whole ethos of, of where you came from. And that sucks. But yeah, so she says, now that you know, the history of the mark, you can understand like our position here. The things that they made us do as slaves was sick. And they forced me and my sisters to eat these fruits, the, uh, the devil fruits for their amusement. And I can't help but wonder you guys, if they were forced to eat these, I'm assuming 
there is just so much power in the celestial dragons that there was no way for them to like bust up out of there. But it's just hard to imagine because the fruits allow them to become so enormous. And like, you know, we have the snake princess turning an entire army. It's like a shipload of Navy guys. She turns all of them to stone. And I'm just sort of like, couldn't you have just done that and been why it feels basically like they were handed machine guns, which doesn't seem smart to me. And they didn't use them. So I'm just going to assume that the power of those guys is just so overwhelming that even this would not have been enough, but it's really hard to imagine. Do you know what I mean? And uh, I love when we, she says like our women, we've been hiding this forever. And because we have eaten these devil fruits, we are able to feed them the story about why we're hiding our backs. But I just can't stand for anyone to know of our past. And it's a, a kind of weird thing where on the one hand, her saying, I can't stand for anyone to know of our past. I get it. This is a really horrific thing she went through. And even though I don't think anybody would judge her, it's so private, you know, like it's just so such a personal, horrible thing that I can't blame anybody who went through something this traumatic and who doesn't want everybody to know about it. You know, it's the sort of thing that could be, it just becomes then a, a topic of conversation with people that you don't know in a way that a lot of folks, you know, when they see a public figure think they have the right to bring certain things up with them when it's like, that's a human being. And you, so I, I'm not, at all saying that this desire to keep it secret is unreasonable. But I did think when she's like, after this is finished, she says to Luffy, so you must be repulsed by me because of my, you know, history as a slave. And Luffy is genuinely like, what? No, I don't care about that. Are you kidding me? And I did appreciate that. This is the sort of thing that it'd be hard for me to understand in general, I think, which is the concept of, of holding somebody responsible for being victimized, which I know happens like her, her asking this feels silly in a sort of objective way. And yet it's not actually silly in the in the world it's like so you know i've already talked about the consequence uh, or the uh the possibility of sexual assault being part of this story even though it's not explicitly mentioned um but there's a uh there was a conversation that got circulated simply because it was so outrageous and it was a facebook post somebody made saying like, hey, men out there, if you found out that your girlfriend had been like gang raped by six guys, would you stay with her or no? And it it was like a full debate in the comments of dudes arguing why they wouldn't want to be with a girl who had gone through that. And it was just absolutely like hideous and baffling to me because they were acting like somehow she was the problem, which I just can't wrap my head around. But it's because this is like the way that society has structured things with women. And I am still underestimating it at every turn, how deep that, that victim blaming goes. And I think that you know, her expectation that he may feel this way is actually valid as much as I want to be like, come on, of course, he's not going to blame you for that. 
uh, apparently that's not fucking uncommon. So, you know, um, and we then get this like thing with, uh, with the granny who she, Hancock is like crying freely at this point. And granny is kind of jubilant here in a way that I was like, girl, I get what you're trying to say, but can you fucking not right now? She's just so excited that Hancock is showing some genuine emotion and is like, this is what your people want to see from you. And you really, you know, there are times where it seems like you aren't even really a person. And I'm glad to see you having some sort of emotional reaction to something. And again, like not now, what are you doing? This woman is just recounting a horrific trauma of years You know, like it would be bad enough if she had just been like beaten and captured and mistreated for a day. This shit went on for four years. So, yeah, I think that maybe just dial it back a little bit that you're so excited that she's crying, talking about this horrific thing she went to through just genuinely, lady, what are you doing? And she then like brings up uh Hancock like says something about how granny is mocking her and granny says something about how I saved you and your sisters you would have starved to death on some island if I hadn't like gone into waters that were unapproved and saved you guys and so I think maybe that's a part of why like she is exiled now is that she was doing something that was unsanctioned but all Hancock says is you did do us that small kindness and granny gets really upset and it's just like I treated you like you were my own daughters and you're going to call it a small kindness. Are you for real? And she is so livid. And again, granny, now is not the time. She's really screaming in her face. You would have starved to death if it wasn't for me. Um, just look, do I think that Hancock has been horrible? Yes. Is this the time? Like, really? Get Just read the room, lady. So, yeah, this... Uh, sorry, there's a bunch of people in the comments. Hold on, guys. Let me just jump over there. Um, uh, oh, David says, The Skypeans worshipped the sun, remember? I do not remember, but I believe you. He says, I have a theory that only celestial dragons can kill celestial dragons. That's why it was amusing to give slaves devil fruit. Interesting. Huh. Okay. I mean, even if you can't kill them, you could still, I would think, get away from them. Like, Luffy was able to knock that guy out. He was fucking, like, unconscious. But, I don't know. Whatever. Uh, Florian says, I think she finds her own past repulsive and therefore thinks she herself is repulsive. She's kind of projecting her own feelings on Luffy, I think. I definitely agree with that. Um, David says, I suspect the women who got pregnant off island pretend that they don't know what men are in order to spare Boa's feelings. They don't want their positive experiences to be pushed in her face. Um, I'm sorry, which one's Boa, David? Is that the woman that he was like befriending that got turned into a statue? Um, I do not agree with you because of like, in the context, there's nobody like thinking that anybody's pretending. It just doesn't make any sense. You could say that you know what a man is without necessarily getting graphic about the great sex you had but the boss lady of the island oh is her name boa i don't rem- okay i just don't remember that but yeah it's a type of snake so i guess that makes sense um i'm just so it's boa hank right thank you 
Thank you, Florian. Um, yeah, I just I I accept that you're he- trying to headcanon this, but I don't feel feel like that really makes sense. Nevertheless, it doesn't matter. Like for the sake of of the joke, I get why they do it the way they do. But um. So this, like when Luffy is just like, of course, I don't find you repulsive. She turns around and she has like this pink flush on her cheeks and seems actually like moved. And it's funny because this is the first time that she's looked cute to me because otherwise her eyes have been very sort of flat and there's been such a haughtiness and distance in her face. But when she's turned around here and he's talking to her, her eyes are given a lot more depth and she's got that blush and she just looks so much prettier with those like details added. The the, the eyes, the way her eyes looked before there was something about them that was so dead, you know, and she tells Luffy, you know what? I've decided I like you. And if there's some place that you want to go, my ship is at your command. And Luffy gets very excited and says, really? And that is when it cuts to, to be continued. So that is the end of the episode. Um, but yeah, I'm really curious how Luffy is going to like, because it would be one thing to be like, oh, you can take my ship. If she's not going to go with him, like, he's not going to be on an entire ship by himself. So I have to assume somebody's going to come. And I'm thinking it probably would be the lady that he put it all on the line for. But how does he know where to go? How does he know where to navigate? Does he explain to them where he had been, I guess, and they can take him there? And we also have the issue of these sea kings, but I guess they've got ships now that can cross over that. So anyway, there's just a lot, like... You know, we haven't seen any of the rest of the Straw Hat crew. So what I'm sort of hoping for is next episode, we jump over to where some of them are and get to see what kind of adventures they've been up to. Because I am not sure how much control there was to where they wound up and whether they're in the same place or if they're completely split up or what's going on with that. Um... Oh, right. Florian says he's got Rayleigh's Viva card, which I keep forgetting about those. That's right. But yeah, I just, uh, I want to see what everybody else has been up to. And like, part of me hopes that they are all together, but if they're together and Luffy was the only one that was separate, that would suck. So I guess they may all be separate. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't really have any theories on that. I I just hope like the thing is with this island of women I don't want them to get pulled into anything else. So while I want his friends to come with him, the people that he's befriended here, I also don't really want them to do that because I would like them to stay isolated in their little utopia because it seems like the place to be. So I think I'm just going to sort of theorize that they give him a ship and let him go by himself, even though that doesn't sound likely at all. That's my ideal. Um, all right. Well, it's time to wrap up, but thank you again, Florian for commissioning this. Thank you to Florian and David for hanging out here. I feel like there was another person here. Am I wrong? Nope. Just looks like you too, but thank you guys again. Appreciate you both being here and, um, hopefully everybody will be able to find this a little bit more easily next time. Thank you all for listening. Until next time, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.